Hello everyone, good evening. Um, my name's James Robbins, diplomatic correspondent of the BBC, but much more important, dear friend of Jim's, and I'll just start by saying that whenever he and I meet, either in the office or in some foreign field, we usually start by talking about music and not about the story. <laughs> um, and we have a sort of dreadful competition of one-upmanship to see um, who's been to which far-flung opera house that the other one hasn't managed to achieve. I think I'm still up on Helsinki, unless you You certainly are. Helsinki yeah. and, and opera I'll in Pretoria, I think. I'll leave that you with that one. Jim yep. has still yeah, been spared. Absolutely. Tonight, we're going to talk about music, uh, war, and revolution. Music, I'm sure you'll all agree, can be intensely political. It can be a political weapon. Uh, it can be encouraged by regimes where it can be used to instill ideology. It can be banned where it's seen as subversive. It can be censored uh, where specific content is deemed too dangerous. I'm thinking of, uh, I think, the Neapolitan censors who mm. took grave exception to the idea that uh, Verdi in a masked ball should portray uh, the assassination of a European monarch, uh, far too dangerous. So Paul Verdi was made by the Roman censors. He couldn't put it on in Naples at all. Uh, he was made to shift the action to, uh, the, the, to colonial America uh, and have the, the hero not as a king, not as a Swedish king, but as the colonial governor. Uh, so you can see that music can be much more dangerous than we might necessarily have thought. But music also, I suppose, celebrates and mourns that um, dreadful pastime of mankind, the making of war. Uh, it also summons people to battle uh, and is used sometimes, I think, on the battlefield to intimidate the enemy. Uh, but it's for Jim to tell us what he wants to talk about tonight. I'm going to be guided by him in this week of remembrance, music, war, revolution. Jim. Thanks. James, there will be no bagpipes from the battlefields, I can... Sorry to hear that. <laughs> well, they're wonderful in their way. Um, I suppose that what I should say, uh, for starters, is that I did a Radio 4 series and I've written a book which is limited, and I'm conscious that these are limitations, to the European classical tradition, which is an awful phrase that sort of hangs heavy on my lips, but it's, it's accurate in a way, and it's, it's an important distinction because I'm not suggesting that what that represents is anything like the musical story, but it's a bit of the story, and it's a story that's imprinted um, on our culture. And it's quite striking to me that people who say, if you talk to them about classical music, well, I don't really know much about that, uh, will listen to a Beethoven symphony or a Mozart piano concerto or a bit of this and that and suddenly recognize that it speaks with a little voice that's deep inside them. So my starting point was that this is part of our culture, which I'm sure we all accept as a simple fact. This little angle on it is fascinating because if you think of the European cultural story and the way music has played its part, it does tell the story of wars and disasters and revolutions in an extraordinarily poignant and eloquent way. I tell stories for a living. They're true, because it's the BBC. At least when they're told, they're true. <laughs> and in many ways, this, this book of the series is a business of telling stories. It's trying to say, here are characters, here are things that happened here are collisions between events and character that, that made something special. And I'm very moved um, always in looking back at moments that change things. You know, if you think what it was like to be in St. Mark's in Venice in the last couple of decades of the 16th century, I mean, here was this place which was reeking, I mean, literally because of the incense of Byzantium and the East which was decorated with gold that had been brought back by the travelers, which was dark with flickering candles, which created a very special atmosphere, and which attracted, in the end, Monteverdi, but the, the Gabrielli family initially, who couldn't but write music that matched the magnificent. 
But if you look back further to Notre Dame in the 12th century in Paris, the 12th, 13th century is being built, this huge place establishing the power and the authority of the church in temporal matters as well as spiritual matters, establishing its position. Simple old plain chant from the monasteries wouldn't do, so you started to get polyphony, harmony, as we would call it, I suppose, crudely speaking, and Perrottet and Lenin and all these people started to write things that would fill the space and give it something that matched its magnificence. So again and again, you find things that uh, tell you something about our story. And in the um, matter of war, I'm haunted, or haunted, moved and touched by one particular story that could sort of start us off and finish us off. Think of yourself in Berlin in 1945. The, uh, Hitler is dead, the Russians and the Americans have arrived. And the Americans are going around doing house-to-house -house searches. And the GIs, I assume, from the back streets of Chicago are knocking on doors, the few doors that were still standing, finding out who was there and who they were and what they were doing and whether they should be noted down, and presumably whether they were Martin Bormann or not. But anyway, that's another matter. Um, and they came to one house, knocked on the door, went in, old man sitting in the corner. And they said, who are you? Identify yourself. And the old man said, simply, my name is Richard Strauss. I am the composer of Der Rosenkavalier. And it's a wonderful moment because what the GIs made of that, I know not. <laughs> but his mind went back instantly to the last years before the fall, uh, when in uh, the declining years of the Habsburg Empire, you could write about high society in Vienna in 1910, with all the brilliance and magnificence of that opera, but with a sense of melancholy as well, with a shaft of darkness in it. And what he was doing was flinging himself back to the European tradition which he knew and had been destroyed. He talked about my Dresden, my Leipzig, my Weimar, all gone, in ruins, literally. But that still worked. And that seems to me to tell the story of how music has charted um, our kind of cultural story. We're going to have little snatches. It seems to me if you look back, we could go back forever, but if you go back to the beginning of the 19th century, Beethoven was very moved by the French Revolution. Um, it seemed to him to be an enlightenment. And then, of course, he was horrified by Napoleon's assumption of imperial power, where the Pope was summoned to Notre Dame, not to conduct the ceremony, but to witness it, when Napoleon wore laurel wreaths and purple and became emperor, and famously, Beethoven scored Napoleon's name off the title page of the Eroica Symphony, which was meant to be his third symphony, a celebration of heroism and brilliance and forward-looking statesmanship. And it's worth just hearing the beginning of it, because it was a radical piece of music, and it also said something important. And I think you can do better, no better than start an evening like this with a a blast of the beginning of the Eroica. Marina, over to you.
afraid we have to, otherwise we'd be here all night. But well, I just want to. Was, that was the Carry On 62 recording, actually, which is the, you know, the, that's the Berlin Philharmonic in 62 with Carry On, which is the one, really, I think. Anyway. I just wanted to challenge Jim a bit because I wanted to take him out of his comfort zone where Sorry. music yes. is necessarily, a, a, as it were, a, a force for good because Beethoven, or, although he was a, a fantastic champion of, of liberty and of enlightenment, uh, I mean, the prisoner's chorus in Fidelia, yes. whatever. Um, he wasn't above writing dreadful potboilers, oh, and the worst of them absolutely. was Beethoven Wellington's Victory, uh, yes. arguably. Yes. Uh, written for an extraordinarily mechanical machine, not even for an orchestra. Uh, it earned him a lot of money, uh, but it was a shocking example of the abuse of music, wasn't well, it? Well, I think, absolutely. And I think Beethoven, in many ways, uh, was a fairly unpleasant character. I mean, Schubert was wandering around the coffee houses of Vienna, as we've all done in our time. You, I'm sure, have done yeah, in your yeah. time. Um, many people in this room have, in the, in the 1820s. And he never had the courage, apparently, to speak to him, although he saw him and carried a torch, literally, at his funeral in 1827, not knowing that he would be... Uh, dead within two years uh, of the traditional romantic artist's disease. I need not name it. No doubt he passed it on. Um, and uh, Beethoven, when he wrote the Razumovsky quartets, extraordinary things, which of course he couldn't hear by that stage. He really was stone deaf. The leader of the greatest Viennese string quartet, uh, on seeing the score, said, this is unplayable. And Beethoven said, well, it wasn't written for the likes of you. It was written for the future. I think I quote him accurately. Pretty nasty piece of work in many ways. And not above pot boilers. But the point about the Eroica is interesting because he began it as a celebration of heroism, obviously. It was meant to display what the best of um, statesmanship could produce. He was then disappointed. But what he did, because of Napoleon, what he did in the piece was to bring to the Haydn structure of symphonies that had been established a completely new dimension. And people who heard that for the first time were astonished. I mean, it was two or three times as long as anything they were used to hearing. The way he used the themes in the symphony was new. So what he was doing was saying, I'm talking about something important in contemporary life as I see it, namely the way that the revolutionary spirit, or whatever it was called in his mind, can be carried on. And what that means is that the creative spirit that I bring to it develops something new. And the reason that Beethoven, I think, is extraordinary, um, it's almost uh, so banal it doesn't need to be said, is that he he did this again and again. I mean, he reinvented the symphony, uh, created the, 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 the ground on which the romantic composers were able to bring the symphony to its apogee. Uh, he brought the string quartet, which Haydn had more or less invented, to a peak which has probably not been surpassed, except occasionally by one or two people who've popped up. Um, and it was an extraordinary achievement. And I think when you hear the beginning of the Eroica, you can't but be excited. And he's talking about events in Europe. I, I want to take Jim forward in the 19th century to Verdi, but I, he mentioned Haydn, and I can't resist something that I learned for the first time today, which was that Leonard Bernstein apparently chose Haydn's mass in time of war uh, for an anti-Vietnam concert in Washington uh, at the height so, of that yeah. protest. And apparently, it, it caused a near sensation in Washington, and everybody thought this was went to the heart of uh, what lay in their soul. And I didn't know that until I read it. No, no, well, I didn't know it um, until I heard it from you. That's and, fascinating, yeah. But moving on, I wanted to, uh, to you to deal a bit with myth, because a certain amount of myth has grown up around composers. And the one Absolutely. I want to talk about, Giuseppe Verdi, um, the Risorgimento, the idea that Verdi somehow played a major part in the unification of Italy. I'm not really sure that I accept this, and it's based around I. one particular anecdote which doesn't even stand up to scrutiny. Well, exactly, and I think that he, you know, you only have to look at the point where he became a parliamentarian late in life, and he was pretty <coughs> bored by it in northern Italy. And the fact remains that despite that, he had become a kind of sounding board because he was able to write in the way that he did 
his voice seemed to echo in the streets. And you've got to remember what Italy was like at that time with respect to opera. I mean, there's a wonderful thing. When Stondahl, if I can find it, when Stondahl went to write a piece about um, a, a book, a biography of Rossini in the early 19th century, in the 1820s, he described what it was like when um, the opera came to town, as it were. And um, he went to a small town where Rossini was uh, performing, or going to write the opera, and he, he talked about the way that for about three weeks before it happened, the whole town was exercised as if there was going to be a cup final there. And the entire populace was engaged in this enterprise. I mean, Rossini was uh, noticeably slow in producing the scores. There's a great story, if I might interrupt your flow. When he was finishing La Gazzaladra, the thieving magpie, best known for its overture and really nothing else, at La Scala, he got to La Scala, and on the day of the performance, he hadn't written the overture. And the manager of La Scala said, Rossini, come on, and took him up to the attic above the theater and got the stage carpenters to put boards across the door, nailed in, locked him in <laughs> until he wrote an overture. And he was passing the, um, the pages at the window, and they were passed down, and there was a copyist there, and they were given to the orchestra, who duly played the overture at seven o'clock in the evening. I mean, I mean, you imagine, I mean, the ferment, you know, the theater in uh, the Teatro San Carlo in um, Naples had a, literally had a casino in the foyer. So you went in, and you, you gambled a bit, and you went in, and then there were fires lit where the, the food was cooked for those who had boxes, and the servants were then allowed to look through the grills um, at the sort of second act after they cooked the dinner for the, the first interval. But on the, on the floor, on, on the, in the stalls, it was a, a pretty wide spectrum of society. And people would go four or five times a week. And all the beggars in the streets, of course, knew the tunes. And they would pass them around. So you had this sense of... And so the opera was utterly central to the whole thing. So when Verdi began to write in a way that seemed to pick up the pulse of politics, though that, I agree with you absolutely, was not the original intention, it was natural that there was a, what BBC accountants would call a synergy taking place. And I mean, this is probably the best example, Marina. In a moment, we'll be in Milan, don't worry. I hope. Not in Leningrad. It's fine, that's Milan.
sorry, but we, I mean, we again would be here all night. But when Verdi died, in, um, he had the same problem, it sounds uh, banal, but had the same problem with George Schulte, who died in the same week as the Princess of Wales, which, you know, buggers the obituaries. Um, Verdi died in the same week as Queen Victoria in January, January, February, anyway, 1901. He had a stroke in the Grand Hotel Milan. What a way to go. And um, when the cortege went through the streets of Milan and passed La Scala, the crowd impromptu, I mean, sang that. And you know that when uh, Nabucco was first performed, I think in the early 1840s, it seemed to have those were the Hebrew slaves talking about freedom. It had a kind of resonance, and music found a way of expressing that which you know was censored in print, was difficult, and somehow managed to touch the spot. And I think, you know, I think you and I uh, both love Verdi, and you know he was a man who was born in the age of Napoleon, I think, in 1813, died. Um, at the end of the Victorian age. I mean, what a span. And writing Falstaff, which looked ahead to, we don't want to be musicological, but I mean, which looked ahead to operas that were written, you know, 50 years later. Extraordinary character. But politically, and in terms of uh, glory, war, politics, Verdi wrote a soundtrack for what happened in Italy between, what, 1845 and 1870. I just wanted to add two quick things about uh, Verdi as, as it were, a potential revolutionary, or at least as, as a force for sedition, if you like, because mm. uh, one is that the, there's this famous story, which I think is probably not true, uh, that at the first performance of Nabucco mm. at La Scala, mm -hmm. the crowd called for an encore of Vapensiero, mm. the chorus of Hebrew slaves, which uh, in a, uh, at a time when encores were specifically banned by the right. national censors, right. as I suppose drawing attention uh, to something which might be potentially dangerous. I'm sorry to say the story isn't quite true because it wasn't Valpensiero. All the was best ones are not quite All the best true. stories aren't true. The other thing I just wanted to mention, because I think it's quite interesting in the context of music as a political or social weapon for change, is that if any of you saw Verdi's, I think, fantastic opera, Stifelio, when it was recently put on at the Opera House uh, here in London in Covent Garden, now that was an opera that was suppressed, banned by the Italians, and actually disappeared from the repertoire all over the world for the best part of a century simply because it dealt with the idea mm. of adultery by, as it happens, a Protestant clergyman. Um, and that in 19th century uh, Europe or 19th century Italy was deemed to be too dangerous a subject to be dealt with in the Opera House. You may think it's not central to the theme of war, but it certainly is to the theme of revolution and music having a profound social and, and political effect. But uh, I, I think we should... Yeah, we'll, jump. On. Um, we'll jump. Uh, yeah. We should jump forward. Uh, just for those of you who are interested, I, I determined there should be time for questions and discussion yes. at the end. Yes, uh, I yes. Think the so idea let's get a move on. That we should yes. try and, we should try and we get done by through. now. Um, less talking, the, more music. Into the 20th century? Into the 20th century. Uh, the, the century of wars. Now, where do you want to start in the century of wars? Well, uh, probably with it. Am I still engaged with uh, my mm -hmm. public? Or is it dropped off? <laughs> I'll just talk for a moment yeah, while this is sorted out. Um, the, um, it is the century of wars, and, and the First World War is the <laughs> extraordinary moment where music, it seems to me, tells the story. And if you look at the music of England, and I use England rather than Britain quite deliberately, and you talk about Elgar, uh, extraordinary figure, obviously. Now. The thing that it seems to me is uh, central to Elgar is the absence of jingoism. Because people listen to Land of Hope and Glory uh, from one of the pomp and circumstance marches, they think that Elgar in the period before the First World War, and he'd come to prominence as a national figure, really, first at the Queen's uh, Diamond Jubilee in 1897, was a jingoistic composer. He never was. But in the period up to the First World War, there was a wonderful calm about his writing in the First and Second Symphonies, even in the Violin Concerto. But it was always undercut by a sense of darkness, by a sense of almost coming loss. Now, I don't think you 
uh, can fix that on him intellectually. There's no evidence that he knew exactly what the depths of the horror would be. But I think there's always a feeling that it's there. Yeats referred to Elgar as having a heroic melancholy. Ernest Newman, the critic, talked about a sunset quality in his work. And if you listen to the first of the second symphonies, or even the violin concerto, which is a very difficult piece to do, and the best recording is Menuhin's one at aged 15 or 16 in the early 30s with Elgar conducting. And then you compare it with what happened at the end of the First World War, you get your first impression, I think, in music in this country of what the change was. And if you take the Elgar cello concerto, which was finished um, over 1918-19, after the armistice, and you listen to the end of it, the fourth movement, you hear um, an angst, a feeling of loss. The cello is sort of wandering around. It's angry, it's passionate, it's let loose. And all the control and the elegiac certainty of the period up to, I suppose, the death of the king in 1910 has gone. I mean, this is the last movement of the, the beginning of the last movement of the cello concerto. I mean, again, we could go on, but I mean, that couldn't have been written before the First World War. I, uh, just to echo everything Jim said, I mean, there are lots of things about Elgar that people imagine uh, are, in some ways, celebrations yeah. of imperialism, and I think perhaps even imagine the celebrations of imperial violence. But even in the piece not much performed now, The Spirit of England, where he yeah. uses poems by Lawrence Binion. I just wanted to read you one stanza of Binion's that Elgar sets, because it seems to me it goes to the heart yeah. of this. For you, you too, to battle go, not with the marching drums and cheers, but in the watch of solitude, and through the boundless night of fears. And not a stab of steel is pressed home, but invisibly it tore and entered first a woman's breast. Well, exactly. And I just want to go straight on to another piece because it's linked with exactly that point. Um, Ivor Gurney, who uh, went as a private to France with great enthusiasm, I think in 1915, was a brilliant student at the Royal College, uh, was also a poet, and he was gassed and wounded and invalided out, I think, in 1917. The depression that he'd suffered as a child, or as a young man anyway, uh, returned in a, a very virulent form. And he spent most of the, the rest of his life, the following 20 years, in, in hospital. And was broken artistically and uh, emotionally by the experience. But while he was in the trenches, he wrote poetry and he set songs, some of them to other people's verse some to his own and they seem to me to catch and you know remember this weekend is coming up terribly poignantly the um the depth of the horror the discovery of what was being lost and he was sitting in the trenches and 
we had a piece in the program this morning about a, a, a diary had been discovered by a family where um, a guy had written, who was a captain, who was quite well on in years, I think, in his 30s, had gone to France. He wrote beautifully about what it was like. I mean, the, this wonderful phrase about the rats walking over them as they slept and licking the brilliantine from their hair. And the blue bottles, these vast blue bottles coming, which they know, they knew, had been um, nurtured and born in the corpses, and fed in the corpses, these vast things coming. If you anyway, Garni wrote songs, and this, Seven Meadow, which is Ian Partridge singing, strikes me as a piece of um, melancholy and brilliance, which really deserves to be celebrated. I mean, just listen to, th listen to this, it's brilliant. Gurney suffered a, a terrible end, didn't he? Because yeah. he descended into madness, he had bipolar disease, he was yeah. committed to an asylum and died relatively very young. And I think I'm right in saying that more or less everybody we're going to talk about in the 20th century was in some way a victim, it seems to me, of, of, oh, of right. intolerance, of misunderstanding, or of being put under intolerable political <coughs> pressure, or of being in some way a social misfit. Uh, That's right. And, but I think the first, perhaps, uh, is a man who was manipulated more by intolerant politics than almost any other composer. Well, yes, I, I mean, I was talking to Ed Volomey earlier about this, who knows more about Shostakovich than I do, but if, you, if you'd wandered into the splendid palace cinema in Leningrad in about 1924, on a sort of wet Wednesday afternoon, to watch a film by Kuleshev pre-Eisenstein, you might have seen a film called I think there was one called The Adventures of Mr. West in the Land of the Bolsheviks. What fun that would have been. And of course, silent film, 23, 24, around about that time. And there would have been in the pit um, a piano and a guy sitting there banging away, trying to make sense of the jerky images on the screen accompanying it. It would have been Shostakovich. Uh, he was at the conservatoire. He was earning money in the afternoons. He'd moved cinemas because he, he found one that would pay him a little more to support his family as he went through his musical studies. And he complained bitterly about the effect that this movie life was having on him. He said, you know, this is sort of degrading my um, sort of artistic... Complete rubbish, of course, because in fact what it did, I mean, rather than the way that Puccini can um, move with amazing speed and brilliance on the operatic stage in a cinematic way, Shostakovich, if you listen to the symphonies, understood the lesson of what a great movie producer could do. But his life, it seems to me, catches the whole tragedy of the century. I mean, here he was, um, a passionate supporter of the revolution, of course, first announced by Stalin when he, Stalin saw Lady Macbeth in 36, 
editorial in Pravda saying this man, I mean, this is dreadful, this is awful, it's a rape in the first scene, you know, etc. And Shostakovich then having to write a terrible um, line at the top of his next symphony um, about a response to just criticism. Going through his life with this rather ambiguous relationship with the regime being denounced by, Shost uh, uh, by the Stalinists with Prokofiev in 48, the moment in which Prokofiev's wife was sent off to labor camp, came back, lived a long life in the West, but it broke Prokofiev, although he'd already broken with his wife before then. And it's a terrible story. And Shostakovich, when he joined the party finally in the 60s, I think 1960, it was said by most of his family to have been in, in tears at that moment of the final accommodation, but he, he stayed, of course, and lived for another, what, 14 or 15 years after that. And his, his brilliance and his depth seems to me um, carries with it the imprint of that um, toing and froing with the regime, the back and forth. You know, people talk about codes that are, you can hear in the symphonies, which um, are anti-Stalinist in the late 30s. I mean, who knows the truth? But what we do know, of course, is the Leningrad, the seventh, written during the siege, a million people dying around the city, flown out, the score flown out to the West, performed, it was a great battle between London and New York as to who would have it first. Imagine that happening now. And it was performed in London at the proms, I think, just before it was performed in New York. Then flown back to Leningrad, now the orchestra, had been destroyed, effectively, by disease and war. And only 14 or 15 of them left. But they recruited people from the streets. They gave them extra rations for the night to see the symphony through. And they played it. And it was broadcast on loudspeakers into the streets. And the West had already had it. And it was genuinely, even in those rather um, strange days in terms of international communication, a worldwide sensation. And of course, the beginning of it is to me, I mean, just about as um, poignant and dramatic an evocation of war and blitzkrieg as you can imagine. Maris Janssen's conducting the concert about, I mean, it's extraordinary stuff, isn't it? I think your next composer is someone who went to prison for his beliefs. Mm. Michael Tippett, as a conscientious objector, was sent to Wormwood Scrubs. And briefly as a communist, but that passed. Um, now, he borrowed, uh, of course, from an op a whole oppressed people. Uh, to make his great commentary on, on the 20th century, on this century of war. I once saw him conducting um, uh, A Child of Our Time, and it must have been in the mid-60s, I was quite young, and he, uh, I'd, never, I'd never heard it before, and I was quite uh, astounded by it. Um, and he started writing, I think I might, and saying, uh, in 1939, as things were getting going, and took some time. And the extraordinary thing about Tippett was that he understood that you could, you could express um, the unimaginable horror of the present by reaching into the past to, to, to use idioms with which people were familiar. And at one point in, in the uh, oratorio, he 
brilliantly, I think, uh, picks on a, an old Negro spiritual, to use that old phrase, and uses it to express something which was extraordinarily contemporary, and invests it, of course, with his own touch, which would become unmistakable in the years ahead. We just hear it. This is steal away from Tippett's oratorio. If you heard that, you wouldn't say it was Michael Tippett instantly, would you? But he found a way of bringing it in, and it, it was extraordinary what was going on. And if you if you look at what was happening in occupied Europe at the time, um, there is still a residue of music that was written by people who were in the camps. I mean, we know that you know one of the extraordinary things that happened in the in the 20th century, as far as music was concerned, was the sort of diaspora that was produced by those who had to flee for their lives from Europe and those who fled for other reasons, just because they didn't like it, um, two different, quite distinct groups of people. But of course, there were those who stayed for one reason or another, and those who were captured. And even in the camps, they were writing music. And there's one little snatch it would be really nice to play here, which is by um, Hans Krasser, who was in Terrazin camp, which was a kind of, uh, wasn't called a camp, it was called an enclave, wasn't it? It was a sort of ghetto. But it was effectively a transit camp for Auschwitz. And what's extraordinary about this, and it's in English, it's just a little snatch, is that it's an opera called Brunderbar, and it's a kind of Hansel and Gretel story. But there's a baddie in the woods, and I mean, it's Hitler, clearly. And they construct this little opera, which was performed. Now, Kasa was eventually exterminated. And most of the people who were in the original productions in the camp ended up being exterminated. But they were determined to do it. I mean, they still they wrote this stuff, and they performed it. And if you listen to this, just a less than a minute, you, you get the sense of that absolutely indomitable spirit we're still going to make fun of these people, even though we know we're going to die. I find this strangely moving. Everything in life was funny, nothing given away. For the finer things in life you must be able to pay. I mean, to write a comic opera in a concentration camp is quite something, <laughs> isn't it? I never heard that before. No, I mean, it's amazing. And, uh, I mean, he died, and, you know, who knows how many great musicians died in those circumstances. But to actually you know, feel, I've got to write this stuff, and 
you know, when I was writing the book and doing the series, when the point to me was whether we're talking about war, revolution, um, periods of um, you know, difficulty for artists or not, it's the constant urge to do it, the feeling of an obligation that this must be done that is so remarkable. And there's a little snatch again from uh, Messiaen, Olivier Messiaen, who became such an extraordinary figure after the war and a kind of father figure to Boulez and all these people who went their own way in rather strange directions sometimes. But Messiaen had been arrested quite early on after the German occupation of France and taken as a prisoner of war. He wasn't Jewish, of course. He was a very uh, devout Catholic, uh, which he remained uh, for all of his life, but he was taken to a prisoner of war camp. And in Silesia, he met um, the makings of a string quartet. And he thought, well, I'd better write something for them. And he wrote the quartet for the end of time, in which he played a part. And they had it on a Saturday night in the camp theater. Now, there are different versions about how many people were there. Some say hundreds, some say thousands. I think probably hundreds rather than thousands. But what is clear was that they were prisoners who were used to hearing a concert on a Saturday night. It was one of their treats. And most of them certainly had never heard anything like this. Messiaen was beginning to find an expression for his rather mystical uh, Catholicism which then famously embraced birdsong and so on to give a completely otherworldly feel to his music. And he produced this quartet for the end of time, which was a very uh, devout piece in the sense that it made a, an explicitly Catholic statement. But imagine being in the camp in Silesia on a Saturday night and just hearing this. It's a wonderful piece of music, and the, the poignancy and the expression of the horror that he was experiencing, which you know was not as great as the horror that many others experienced. He was simply being incarcerated, not threatened with death. But you feel the period there so vividly. And just in this little section, if I may usurp you for a second, just to, to slip ahead, that whole period from the mid-30s to the 60s, I suppose, uh, produced music that speaks, I think, still extraordinarily eloquently of that time. And Britain's War Requiem for Coventry Cathedral, um, which of course had a particular significance in its rebuilding, first performed in the, at the very beginning of the 60s, was an amazing um, piece of work. I mean, Britain, you know, when Britain died in 1976, his death was the lead on the BBC Radio News. I invite you to consider two things, whether there's anyone who would be the lead on the news and whether, even if there were, the BBC would have it as the lead on the news. I mean, this, these are interesting questions we could discuss uh, all evening. But the War Requiem um, is amazing. And the, the, I mean, this is a, from the original cast, so to speak. This is Peter Pierce singing the Agnus Dei, which uh, I think really doesn't need any commentary. <laughs> 
course, what Britain did was to use um, the war poetry of the First World War as a way of um, giving voice to his feelings that were in the music. I mean, a, a pacifist, of course, would uh, come back from America in the course of the war. Uh, a curious thing, because he, he was in exile there with Auden and his circle, but he felt the pull to come back. And he'd read Crabbe's poem, The Borough, when he was in, I think he was in LA at the time. But he'd read an essay by Forster, I think, about Crabbe's poem, read it. And of course, it was the inception of Grimes, which was the extraordinary opera about loneliness, isolation, the power of the sea, sadness of life, the uh, inevitability of tragedy which was performed for the first time at Sadler's Wells on the night before VE Day. So there is Britain, uh, an outsider, because he was gay, of course, and uh, always felt an outsider, but with his pacifism very, very near the surface, yet being, in some ways, one of the great adornments of the end of the war, because Grimes was uh, a wonderful artistic achievement. And that war requiem in the early 60s seems to me to sum up what had happened in music over the last 20, 30 years, that it f had found a way of expressing that sort of plangent horror of war, not with great sort of clashing uh, chords, though Shostakovich could do that rather well, but with that voice that I suspect to us 40, 50 years later, is still absolutely unmistakable, don't you think? Yeah, I do. But, but the Britain War Requiem, I suggest yes. to Jim, is the absolutely central work in musical literature yeah. about war. There's nothing yeah, there's greater. Nothing, there's nothing better in our time. It, it's also, to use my, the word I yes. chose before again, it, it's also very seditious because it smashes together really angry poetry of Wilfred Owen yeah. and the liturgy of the Requiem Mass. And yet it was possible for it to be used as a work of reconciliation. I mean, That's it was right. first performed in Coventry Cathedral uh, in the city which represented the consequences of the Blitz. Uh, it was certainly written for, I'm not sure they were all there to perform it, it was written for the great Russian soprano Galina Vishnovskaya she was and there, for Dietrich yeah. fischer -Dieska, yes. Dieska to represent Germany. So in every aspect, it was, uh, it was, a, it was a political piece uh, uh, as well as a fantastic piece in the musical literature, I mean, I, I mean, the only, the, the, the rather um, obvious but important point that um, I wanted to make in writing this thing, which is obviously not on the specific subject, but more broadly about music in a, in a very sort of general way, is that several things need, I think, to be kept quite close to the surface of our minds. One that there is an obligation and an urge to create uh, music, to find original ways of expressing feelings in musical language that will not go away. I mean, the notion that this will just stop uniquely in our time seems to me manifestly absurd. Secondly, that it's an activity which is of enormous importance not only to the artists who do it because they have to, because there's no other way of living but to get this stuff out, but to those who can hear it and etch their own stories on the kind of musical landscape that's presented to them. And thirdly, because it reminds us at a kind of distant age, looking back on it, what our story is, how it's been put together, where its dark moments and its light moments came, what the contours of its landscape are. And that seems to me terribly important. And before we go to questions, it would be quite nice, would it not, to go back to Richard Strauss sitting in his rather lonely house in Berlin saying, uh, you know, you probably don't know who I am, but I did write Der Rosenkavalier. So a very nice way to end, it seems to me, would be to put war to one side just for a second and listen to the finale of De Rosen Cavalier. 
I'm not quite sure how Jim managed to slip in that piece of stuff. Oh, well, it's just, it's so good. <laughs> it, you know, it, just, it, was, it was a bit like the, the sort of, and finally item, which yes. was, when we use it was sometimes criticised for, that after a news bulletin that's been unutterably bleak, yes. from political chicanery through child murder to war crimes, there's a sense that maybe you need something light at the end of the news, otherwise the entire audience will slash their wrists. Well, it is Richard's size. Um, it's, it's, it. it's, it's time for a discussion and yeah. uh, time for challenges or, or questions or um, uh, corrections. Mama's uh, who'd like to uh, who'd like to go first? Or perhaps it's just a favourite. Ed, follow me, right? Perhaps we should argue whether or not the end of the horizon cut the is optimistic. Well, I don't think it's optimistic. <laughs> it's, it's quite dark, actually. <laughs> He understood what was going on underneath, yeah. And there's always that moment in these things where somebody says, I, I want to make a contribution, I'll ask a question, you go, oh, Christ, fuck, it's one of those. <laughs> Just make your contribution. I, yeah. I, yeah, I wasn't going to interview it from the necessary quartet, I can't resist it. From, right. um, music as defiance is the, is the finger of civilization against barbarism. It was sunny, it was my birthday, I want to do something different. Um, Instead of the usual just sort of being just terrified and seeing horrible things. So I went to hear a programme of Mozart and Haydn by the Surrey of String Quartet. Um, the showing was particularly heavy, and at one point, during a beautiful moment of the slow movement of Haydn's Lark Quartet, one came so close to the theatre that the viola player's music stand fell over. It was stopped. He picked it up, put the score back, and the quartet played on. And I think of all the small moments of defiance over three years in Surrey. That's rather, that's a very nice story. Thank you, Ed. Sorry about that. No, no, that's quite all right. It doesn't have to be a question. That is bad. But someone here was uh, waving. Yeah. Um, yeah. I thank you for everything you said. Who, listening to you talk about these events in history, these anecdotes, what would it be like if you'd been there? Mm. Who is, in your opinion, is scoring the events of today? If, if I can make that smaller, yeah, England is scoring today's events. Well, it's a very... It made an impression on you when you composed it today. Oh, well, uh, you've, you, you've sort of made it easier by your last... You've, you've added a sub-clause which makes it easier, which is something I know very well. Um, yes, there are... Look, there are very good composers around. We, we, we know that. I mean, there are people who objectively can fill holes. Uh, people listen to, uh, let's talk about Americans as well, just for the sake of the argument. People listen to John Adams in huge numbers, Philip Glass in huge numbers. In this country, Adesh has become a kind of cult figure. Macmillan is listened to in enormous numbers. Taverner in this rather strange, mystical kind of end of the century way is listened to in uh, with, with great attention, and there are all sorts of others underneath them. But that slightly avoids your main question as to who is who's talking about time. And the answer is I'm not sure. Um, to my ears, I mean, these people are always, I don't know, we grew up, didn't we, uh, those of us who grew up in the 60s or the 70s or the 50s even, with a feeling that um, we were supposed to believe that it was all going wrong that you know, everyone was disappearing into a kind of cul-de-sac. And the great classics were being... I remember the first time I met Bert Whistle, which is in the 90s or the late 80s. And I was introduced to him at a party, and here was Harrison Bert Whistle, the enfant terrible. He wasn't very enfant in those days, but anyway, he was terrible. And I think panic had been on at the proms or something. You know, it was a great sort of kerfuffle. And this was the man who was bringing destruction to British culture. Someone said, oh, there's Harry Bert Whistle. He wants to have a word with you. And he came over and he said, oh, there's something I want to ask you. And he'd come into the corner. And I thought, oh, my God, what's it? Some terribly sort of intellectual thing that I would be unable to sort of deal with from this, you know, very very serious musician, he leaned over and he said, something I've always wanted to know, what does Charlotte Green really look like? <laughs> he said, I lie in my bath listening to the um, shipping forecast, and I think, what's she really like? So, I mean, one has to kind of remember, you've got to come down to earth with these guys. Um, I don't know who's writing a writer. I think, I think Macmillan is a very serious composer, actually, with really interesting... I mean, some people find him uh, difficult because, of course, he's uh, 
um, absolutely um, deeply committed to his particular brand of radical Catholicism, which is, is very much part of a kind of liturgical approach to his music. Some people find that off-putting. I mean, I'm not a Catholic myself, but I don't particularly find it off-putting. And I find his music is getting there in a way that... But, you know, if you were to say who in the contemporary world is writing stuff that people find uh, gripping, I'd have thought it would be Adams or Glass. I mean, those are the those are the people who are writing stuff that... And Glass, you know, Glass was a pupil of, of Boulanger in Paris. Now, she, uh, I think I say in the book, I mean, she was older than the Eiffel Tower, which is a nice phrase. Um, she was born, I think, in 1885, but it, she, she was conducting orchestras um, before the First World War. She knew Debussy. She, she taught Gershwin in the 20s, for God's sake, in Paris. I mean, they were all there. I mean, she knew Stravinsky, obviously, and all these people. And she went on. I mean, she taught Barenboim. She taught John Elliott Gardner. Um, I think Max went there. Maxwell Davis went there at one point. Uh, they all sort of passed through her hand. She was still teaching in the late, I think, in the late 70s, just before she died. And she would always say to them, all her pupils, and it didn't matter whether they were 1970s minimalists or 1920s neoclassicists. The first thing she would say was, go away and learn by heart the two books of the Well-Tempered Clavier. Come back. And when you can play that, Bach's great teaching masterpiece, then we can get moving. But that's the basis. And when I was doing the radio series, in which this, I talked about these two books that Bach wrote in the, what, the 1720s, and then there was a 20-year gap before the second book, going through the keys, uh, preludes and fugues in every key, um, as describing the nervous system of music. And we had an academic advisor who was there to sort of spot any horrors that I might introduce, which I duly did. And he said, the nervous system of music, what does that mean? And I said, well, I know what it means. And he said, well, I don't former professor at the Royal College. And I said, well, I do, and it's going in the script. And we had a very splendid argument about it, which, it, you know, I sort of won because it was on the air. But it's true, it is the nervous system music. And what Bach does in those pieces is to almost describe what music is. And this is a very long way around to, to coming back to your question about what people like Glass and so on are doing, because they have the same devotion to that structure, that nervous system, that kind of, the, the, the capillaries that carry sounds through the keys make the harmonies that Bach understood. I mean, he wrote it for the harpsichord, obviously, in the early 18th century. But people come back to it. I once interviewed Barenboim around the time I think he was doing the wreath lectures, and he said when he got to the B minor fugue at the end of the first book, coming back to C major after, you know, 23 pieces, at the end of the first book, and he played it, it sounded to him as if it had in it everything that had gone before in music and everything that was to come. Now, that's an absurd statement. It's an emotional statement rather than a piece of academic analysis. But emotionally, it's quite interesting because he says, you know, I can hear Schoenberg in there, and I can hear medieval church composers. And of course, he's right, because it was stripped away and if you listen to some modern composers who are going back, I mean, Steve Reich, when he was writing minimalist stuff in the 70s, went back to Paratam, for God's sake, in Notre Dame and listened to all this stuff, said, this is the essence. Everyone else had been trying to say, well, let's get away from the essence and make it all, oh, yeah, well, you heard the end of Rosencavalier. Reich said, well, let's get back to this. So these people are still at it, and I absolutely insist on two things. One, the urge to compose and create will not go away because it's part of human. It's an obligation. The second thing is, the people who say that, you know, those born after the 60s have got cloth ears have got it completely the wrong way around. Well, my kids um, and James's daughter, I mean, who are, you know, sort of same age, um, the iPod generation, with, uh, with the, the, the complicated rock that began in the, you know, when Herman's Hermits turned into Led Zeppelin. 
um, in the early 70s. This is the most complicated, rich sound world you can imagine. So these, a kid of 20 now is hearing more interesting, challenging, um, peculiar, uh, enticing sounds than I did or you did when we were their age. So the notion that they're going to stop wanting to be challenged by music seems to me ridiculous. Now, whether in 20 or 30 years um, people in their 30s will want to go and sit in a concert hall and watch people with white tie and tails is another question, and that's a matter for orchestras. And how it will all uh, work out, I've got no idea, no one has. But uh, the idea that um, there's nothing there and we're somehow at the tail end of a, you know, of a hurricane that's blown itself out in what we call the European tradition just seems to me um, unlikely. Long answer to a short question, sorry. <laughs> it's usually the other way around. Who wants to, to go next? Please. Uh, I, I found your last answer quite interesting because I must have been about 12 or 13 and we were in the school choir which recorded the Requiem. Gosh, you're a lucky man, yeah. And uh, then went on to Les Scala to sing it as well. Um, and I just had a time singing some music but I hadn't realised until now how much it meant to television. You, you stood on the stage at La Scala and sang? Well, <coughs> not quite, because we were the angels. Don't spoil it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you were up in the... We, we were the angels, so um, when we, we did the, uh, <coughs> the proms, etc. Yes. Because uh, we're all school kids, we were yes. just up in the, ga in the gallery. Yeah, yeah. And when we finished, we then ran anywhere and listened to the music on the radio, and then we, we knew our bit was <laughs> yes. ready, yeah, we were yeah, yeah. back up, up on top again. Yeah. But, you know, we were there at... Uh, the scar, Gosh, that's quite, that's, that's lovely. Well, it does mean, I mean, I've just got a, 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 a first chapter for the book, and I'm just going back to childhood piano lessons, you know, um, which so many of us had, or the equivalents, whether it was piano or something else. And, you know, I recognized late in life, well, relatively late in life, you know, what I'd got from the teacher who, you know, struggled and by the time I was 13 or 14, I realized that w most of the lesson was a conversation. This is so that he didn't have to listen to me struggling through some <laughs> ill-rehearsed, you know, Chopin nocturne. But he used to talk to me about, you know, this is what Bach does and this is what Scarlatti does and why don't you listen to some string quartets and all the rest of it. And I realized uh, much, much later how profound the effect of that had been, really. and. And that's still happening, you know, there's been a problem with music in schools and everything, but it's there. And people, you know, the festival hall is full, Covent Garden's full, even the ENO for reasons that we might not understand on some occasions is full. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it's happening. And if, if organizations and institutions, which always have problems with these things, can adapt in the right way, not in some ghastly, politically correct sort of knee-jerk way, but genuinely open the doors in some way, but only in the service of excellence, otherwise it's pointless, um, then, you know, it's alive. Of course it is. And what we mustn't do, I, I mean, to me, the important thing in this country, and it was interesting to see John Tuse's thing, which he chaired independently for the Tories, which came out on uh, we, yesterday, I mean, John's argument uh, uh, about the failure of the arch bureaucracy in this country, I think, is is very powerful. But he's also very powerful in the fact that we mustn't go down the American road and saying, well, actually, uh, a few rich people would do it better, and if we go to a patronage system, all will be well. Well, it isn't well because actually you create a niche, and you really just close the doors, and it's got to be a partnership. And uh, without wishing to make a political point, I mean, it, it has to have a government commitment that is accepted and insisted upon by most people as being a fundamental bit of having a decent society. And then, of course, you top it up with, you know, um, 
coffee mornings and rich people. Of course you do. And that's very, very important. But the government's got to be there. Otherwise, you've abandoned, you know, our history, in my view. Anybody else who'd like to speak? Uh, can I go to the back first, the gentleman at the back? You're going to have to be quite brief. Yeah, 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 sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> this is familiar. Very interesting uh, talk, um, and thank you for not playing any uh, bagpipes. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's all right. Later, later, later. <laughs> did point out one aspect of the presentation. It, it's a very partial presentation, a, a presentation of a, a liberal uh, in intellectual um, Steady on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I felt that, you know, that there was an aspect of this, that, and the devil may not have all the best tunes, but the fact of the matter is that uh, music can be used to appeal to people's of course, instincts of course. as well. And I just, I was kind of looking, I think, for some kind of acknowledgement that uh, right. even the bad guys, you know, invoke music uh, on their side oh, well, as well. And look, the night Hitler died, they played Bruckner's Seventh Symphony on German radio um, as the incarnation, uh, which is just, uh, you know, words fail you, don't they? No, of course, I couldn't have, sorry, you haven't uh, finished, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Really yes, point, you know, yeah. The composers are not always on the side of the angels. Oh, of course. And, you know, it's not for nothing that, uh, that the armies have schools of music and that people march into battle, you know, to... Well, with bagpipes or other instruments. No, of course. And, and uh, you know, jingoism, or, well, not just jingoism, but, but uh, nastiness can be stirred up um, by music. Of course it can. But, you know, I mean, Steiner asked the famous question, how can it be if music is an improving uh, art form that concentration camp guards could listen to or indeed play a Beethoven quartet on a Tuesday evening and then on Wednesday morning go back and turn on the gas ovens. I mean, to me, that isn't a conundrum because music doesn't make you better. It's not, I mean, it isn't a sort of parceled up piece of perfumed soap, which if you put it on will make you smell nice, whatever. It's an offer. That's all it is. It's an offer and you can take it up or you can leave it. But if you take it up and you give it an honesty and a commitment, then it will, it will repay you. But it can be abused, of course it is. It's abused all the time. And people um, have throughout history um, either used you know, musical ideas, musical forms, musical conventions for their own base purposes, whether they be political, religious, whatever it is. Um, all I'm suggesting is that there is uh, something there in the creative spirit in music, which when it's understood, released, and celebrated, can actually be liberating. I don't mean that in a kind of, you know, crude political sense for for certain purposes, but can actually liberate people. And liberation to do what we want and to have the freedom to think the way we want seems to me to be a name that everybody shares. And the notion that, that music's always been used for good purposes is one that I wouldn't even begin to countenance. So I agree with you completely. Uh, I've got to go. Someone hasn't? Yes. Yes. Please. Uh, contemporary music. Uh, in my experience, uh, um, a lot of it's uh, quite hidden, and I'll tell you why. Quite uh, hidden, hidden, yes. Uh, I commissioned Philip Glass to write the music for a film I made, Hamlet of Hell. Mm. And Gosh. Yes. normally, I sit in front of the you know, a symphony orchestra, and yes. it's a thrilling experience, because I can sit back, and they do it. And sure. I Carl Davis. Yes. Um, great composers. When I worked with Glass, uh, I went to his studio in New York, and he was sitting in a box with the cello player. He went ding, ding, and recorded single notes. I went back the next day, he had a trumpet player, bing, 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 and this was hidden. I had no idea what I was getting. Two weeks later, I went to the workshop and it was a lad, and he played the score. And it was thrilling. I mean, it's brilliant. Yeah. 
but it's hidden. I have no idea. I was lost. Now, if it was a concert piece, it could have been played. It was a thrilling piece of music, but it was not accessible to an audience. It was in a laboratory. It was produced in a laboratory. I'm not sure. There's more music. I mean, so much music, contemporary music, is produced in this. Great. Um, Esoteric. Well, what's your conclu what conclusion do you draw from that for I the future? Why, I mean, it's, it's, it's a pity that there's thrilling music uh, and very sort of, I mean, works on the pulse is not accepted. So we are forced not to share this unless it's on a film. And we, are, we have to buy CDs or we are becoming lonelier listening to contemporary music. That's it. It's a slightly different point. I mean, if people are buying CDs or watching films, then it is a collective experience. It's actually a bigger collective experience than it is sitting in a concert hall. I mean, it's a different kind of one. I mean, you don't get the you don't get the visceral thrill, as it were, but um, which I think is very important. I agree with you. But I I think just because one doesn't know in which direction it's going to go, you know, how people uh, who are going to be in their 50s in 20 years time um, bring glass compositions to bear with the history of the tradition that we've all grown up. Just because we don't know what's going to happen doesn't mean that we can't say that it probably will. I think it'll happen in some sort of way or another. I mean, glass is... And I mean, you came away believing that this was somebody with genuine brilliance, even stroke genius. I, 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 I commissioned him. I, yeah. I, 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 I'm thrilled by his music. I'm yeah. Absolutely thrilled. And I thought was, for this particular film, he was ideal. Mm. And he's also a pacifist, so I was, you know. Um, it's, it worked, yeah. It worked. Um, but the, so much, whether it's Rachel, and other minimalists, so much depends on a lab. Yes. And I just, it, I just wonder if some of that really great music. But the interesting thing, I mean, I mean, it's like the theatre. I mean, I, I, I like to sh you know, share the experience. I mean, the, yes. The, the 19th century, 20th century. Yes, right. My, the first conductor I saw was, was Barbarone in the Hallet when I was seven years old, and it, my hair stood on end. I mean, well, I think, brilliant. let me just tell you, uh, just this is by way of a complete end, because we're just past our time. Um, I, what strikes me about this conversation we're having is the way that you mentioned Reich and I mentioned the Palatine business with him, the way that it really is all connected. Uh, it isn't a very long tradition, actually, when you think of it. I mentioned... Um, the uh, business of dying in the wrong week, poor old Verdi. When Schulte died, I think the day after or two days after Diana, I was rung up and said, oh, Schulte's died, he'd be coming in in three or four hours. Just think of something to say. And I went in, four o'clock, and we got somebody to come in and talk about him and say, well, what do we say about him? I said, well, hang on, this is 1997, August 97. Um, here is a man who was taught to play the piano by Bartók, who was taught to conduct by Toscanini, who conducted the first performance of Fidelio in Germany after the war in Frankfurt, and who conducted the music at Richard Strauss's funeral. Now, if you remember that Bartók was taught to play by Liszt, who was taught by a pupil of Beethoven, I mean, just like that. And so it's all there. and. I remember going to interview um, Schiff, the great pianist, Andrew Schiff, starting a Beethoven sonata cycle. I went to um, interview him and in a muse house in Paddington. And we, we'd, we'd gone quite well. And he talked about, he was a Hungarian Jew, went to Austria, uh, was horrified by what was happening in Austria, Haider and so on. and renounced Austrian citizenship and became a British citizen, I think, in the mid-90s. So he moved here. A man of deep convictions and deep feeling for the past of Central Europe. As we came down the stair after the interview, we talked for a couple of hours, he said, let me show you where I work. And there was a room there um, with two grand pianos, sort of like this, you know, 
One of them was a lovely old Steinway. He said, that's a very nice piano. He said, put your hands on the kit right just went. And um, got chopsticks, you know. And I said, that's absolutely beautiful. And he put his hand on it and he said, that was Foot Wengler's piano. Now here was, you know, Foot Wengler, the man who stayed, the man who saluted Hitler, and all sorts of questions about was he a Schindler or was he not? Anyway, he stayed. And here was Schiff, a liberal, leftish, late 20th century Jewish musician paying homage to this tradition, which to him was deeply personal, very close, and valuable because when you get to excellence, brilliance, and the ascent to the mountaintop, everything else passes away. And that seems to me what it's all about in the end. I've got to draw this to a close, but I just want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank Marina, to thank the Frontline Club. I want to thank Jim, of course, in particular. And I just thought I'd quote to you something, starting going back to where we started, which I think was with Beethoven. Something he wrote, actually, uh, in text in the score of the Missa Solemnis, which um, I sang in a few months ago, and it's a fiendishly difficult work to sing. Um, towards the end, there's a very, very sort of angry, rhythmically complex fugue just before the end, uh, which the orchestra found spectacularly difficult. Uh, and then it sort of subsides into a, a sort of troubled, uh, rather questioning end, I would suggest. Anyway, what Beethoven mm. wrote over the final section of the score was prayer for inner and outer peace. And if Beethoven achieved that, he achieved a very great deal. Jim, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>